for one reason is uh, limitations in equipment. Uh, we do all our farming uh, with workhorses. Um, at the time, there was very limited uh, attachments for horse-drawn cultivators uh, for precision in-row cultivation. Uh, really, the tractor equipment was just coming online for this, and now there are these attachments available uh, for horse-drawn cultivators, but uh, <clears throat> between the stones we face on our farm and often dealing with a lot of uh, cover crop residue because we like to use shallow tillage. Uh, we found the best setup was simply two 12-inch uh, sweeps on either side of the row and then uh, straight shovels in the pathway. And so we're leaving actually a six-inch band of uncultivated soil right over the row. And you can imagine uh, that could be kind of a nightmare if you had to deal with that all by hand. Another decision we made early on uh, was not to use irrigation for our field production. And I just want to make it clear that that is not considered a best management practice, but it's a decision we've made and so far it's worked uh, well enough for us. But that means that we don't have the ability just to turn on the water uh, to make up for uh, competition uh, from weeds with the vegetables. Also without irrigation, uh, that rules out the option of plastic culture. I realize that not using plastic almost sounds uh, un-American, but uh, it really does force you to come to terms with weed management. And at the same time, we had this kind of a fantasy goal for our farm of relying on just the two of us to, all, to do all of the farm work. And of course, with that goal, we couldn't afford to spend a lot of time on hand weeding. So <clears throat> the first uh, step, it seems to us, is dealing with perennial weeds. Uh, if you don't have them under control, uh, it's really going to be hard to manage uh, vegetable crops. And on our farm, uh, quackgrass was the big one. And I don't know, Dan, if there's any shots of where we're bringing a uh, contour strip into production, dealing with quackgrass. I don't know how easily you can find that. Um, and if not, don't worry about it. Um, you know, Anne's prior experience was six years working on a large scale organic medicinal herb farm in the state of Washington. And by large scale, I mean, they were bringing in 40 acre fields of peppermint uh, at one shot. And what they did was two years before planting a crop was use an extended uh, bare fallow period to kill the quack grass, and then follow that with a year of cover cropping. Uh, they used a chisel plow that was equipped uh, with a, a kind of sweep attachments near the top. This would kind of lift the quack grass rhizomes to the surface, and then behind the chisel plow was attached a large section of flexible pasture harrow. This would kind of roll the rhizomes out in the sun uh, encourage them uh, to dehydrate. At our uh, site and with our tools, we decided simply to moldboard plow the old sod as shallowly as possible. And that way we could keep the rhizomes near the surface of the soil and just use a traditional spring tooth harrow or cultivator uh, to rip up that root system and dry it out in the sun. And we typically go over the fallow field, say every two to three weeks, over maybe a three month period, and then reseed the fallow field to a thick stand of rye to kind of smother out any uh, surviving uh, quackgrass rhizomes. I do want to really point out that with this strategy, it's very important uh, to be uh, conservation minded. Uh, you don't want to till up a huge field on a steep slope 
and have it wash out, that would not be sustainable. Uh, so some, uh, how would you say, a little wisdom applied to laying out the fields in relatively narrow strips uh, for this first year in getting uh, perennial weeds under control. So after uh, quackgrass was no longer an issue, uh, we noticed two things. First of all, of course, we had annual uh, broadleaf weeds to contend with, but we also noticed that whenever we grew vegetables two years in a row, our silt loam soil really deteriorated. It really kind of shifted more to the silty side than the loamy side. Had a lot more problems with soil crusting and uh, compaction and so on. And so what we decided to do was to divide the fields between the uh, vegetable fields and fields in cover crops. So we literally uh, alternate the fields between vegetable production and uh, fields of cover crops. I don't know if you have a slide of that, Dan, maybe with a, I might right. be plowing down a cover crop and you see onions and then uh, another cash crop in the background. But sure. at any rate, um, the, um, we, we have about six acres in uh, field production, which we've divided into half acre strips. So in every given year, there are six strips in vegetables, six strips uh, in cover crops. And then there's maybe another third of an acre where we have movable high tunnels. Uh, and there we do uh, two years of cover crops and two years of tunnels. So being, uh, how would you say, devoting a whole year to cover crop production gives us so much more time and space, makes it possible to really grow these cover crops almost to maturity, produce a lot of biomass and a big root system. This went a long way to restoring the tilth uh, before going back into vegetable production. And we think there's kind of a connection between doing this and uh, reducing weed pressure in that the cover crops are improving soil tilth, but basically recycling the nutrients that are already there, as well as bringing in some nitrogen from the atmosphere. And uh, that's a very different situation than say using very high rates of compost to maintain soil tilth. In that situation, it is possible uh, to end up with really high nutrient levels, uh, very quickly uh, mineralized nitrogen. And these factors can really stimulate weeds to grow. In other words, it gives them a kind of a competitive advantage uh, with the vegetables. Taking a year out of production to do grow cover crops also allows us to use strategic bare fallow periods between the cover crops to reduce the number of weed seeds in the soil. And unlike that first year when we were dealing with a quackgrass, we we're trying to create a loose, dry seed bed to dehydrate the rhizomes. When we're targeting annual broadleaf weeds, we want to do just the opposite. We want to create a firm, moist seed bed to intentionally germinate uh, these seeds to grow. This is very similar to performing uh, stale seed beds before planting vegetables, except we're able to do this the year before production and we're able to do it in windows uh, that may not uh, be av uh, available to do before planting the vegetables. So uh, the timing of this bare fallow uh, really depends on the life cycle of our highest priority weeds. Uh, so for example, if purslane is the issue, at least in our area, it usually doesn't germinate until the soil temperature is quite warm. So we would want to do a bare fallow period, say in the middle of the summer with warm soil. Uh, proceed that with an overwintering cover crop that would 
shade the soil until that time and then follow it with another cover crop. Uh, pigweed, we might shift that bear fallow period a little bit earlier, lamb's quarter even earlier. Uh, chickweed, a bear fallow period at the start of the spring would be much more appropriate. Selecting the cover crops uh, partly has to do with uh, what is going to be most weed suppressive while they're growing. You know, the last thing we want to do is have weeds growing and going to seed in the cover crops. And it also has to do with what uh, vegetable crops we're preparing for. And the reason I say that is that we... <clears throat> If we've done a good job of depleting the number of weed seeds in the surface of the soil during this bare fallow period, the last thing we want to do the next year before planting the vegetables is to till up the soil deeply and bring new weed seeds to the surface. So whenever possible, we want to use shallow tillage. And so why the cover crop selection is important is if we're going to be planting uh, spring vegetables the next year, we want to use a winter killed cover crop in order to facilitate shallow tillage. Now, if we're going into cash crops that are not planted, uh, say to the middle of the summer, then we can use overwintering cover crops and we'll have plenty of time uh, to use shallow tillage uh, to kill and incorporate them before uh, planting these vegetables. Um, I think it probably goes without saying that it will be difficult to make progress with reducing weed pressure in this fashion if we continue to import weed seeds into the market garden. So we make a big emphasis on using weed-free compost, weed-free mulch materials, weed-free cover crop seed. We also want uh, to mow uh, the grasslands and whatever else around the vegetable fields so that weeds are not uh, blowing in to the fields or tracked in with the equipment. And then uh, just as important, we don't want weeds to go to seed in the vegetables. So yes, it is important to cultivate the vegetables with the system and to hand weed as necessary uh, to prevent them from going to seed. So this is really a whole farm approach to weed management. It's not just one cultural practice, it's many cultural practices orchestrated together with this uh, focus on lowering the weed seed bank in the soil. Okay. We yes. have we have the um, the diagrams from your uh, from your other talk here, but, but the uh, somebody asked about the cover crop clock, and I have that. Oh yes. Here, would, would you like to comment on that? Okay, and so people are looking at that now. They are yes. Yeah, so the <laughs> that was our way of trying to uh, visualize what's happening over the time. Uh, and so if you think of this as a four-year rotation, we have uh, late crops in year two and early crops in year four. And their timing is slightly different, okay? So before the late crops, we're using an overwintering cover crop of rye and hairy vetch. Before the early crops in uh, fallow year three, we're using a winter kill cover crop of oats and peas. Now the dark black areas, those represent tillage. So you can see we have periods of tillage at different times of year over the course of the uh, four year rotation. And that's a great way to keep uh, any one type of weed from getting a foothold. This was kind of our basic original uh, cover crop rotation, uh, but it has changed uh, over time as um, our needs have changed. Um, I don't know if it's 
worth going into the details of that. I don't know, Dan, do you have the chart that shows variations on the four-year cover crop rotation? That uh, may not be in the slide presentation. That may just be in the handout. No, I don't think I do. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think that would be unhandy to talk about without uh, the visual. But um, any any questions about the cover crop clock? And um, Let's see here. Doesn't look like it right now. Uh, Gina, okay. I'm not able to see the q and I'm just seeing the chat right now, but if, if there's anything that's relevant to the cover crop, crop clock, you can ask. ask so them. I have a question and it's from Liz, mm -hmm. but this is about fallow. It says, what does the lengthy fallow with cultivation do to the organic matter? Hmm. Yeah, so what does the length of the bare fallow have to do or how does it affect organic matter? I'm a little bit stumped on answering that because we did a lot of soil testing in the 90s uh, to kind of get a handle of that. We took four fields, uh, we tested spring and fall. So, uh, and I think we did this for eight years. Uh, so in a sense, we literally watched this cover crop clock move across uh, the farm. At that time, we were also sometimes using a full year of uh, leguminous sod with no bare fallow in it. And I don't know if it was something going on with our sampling or the lab, but we really didn't see any difference between the fields in organic matter, but we saw huge differences over the years. Uh, way higher than I think uh, is practical. So I, I'm not quite sure what to do with that information. I would say that uh, we are part of the PASA soil health uh, benchmark study. Um, so that's, you know, just giving you a kind of a snapshot of uh, soil health uh, for each year. Uh, the, in 2019, our organic matter, uh, and this is Sue Cornell, was 2.9 to 3, so it's not stellar, but uh, we haven't run it into the ground either. Our overall uh, rating was excellent, uh, which is a 74, um, which at least in 2018 was basically the median for all 36 vegetable farms, so we weren't at the top, we weren't at the bottom. Uh, 2019, our active carbon uh, was optimal, as were all of the chemical uh, analysis, uh, but uh, the aggregate stability was pretty low. And so uh, whether that is actually a function of our system or just a reflection of our soil type, I think that's going to take a number of years to sort out. Um, but I, I should say that the length of the bare fallow has really changed over the years. I mean, we did that really intensive three-month fallow the first year for quackgrass. Uh, following years uh, was typically six to eight weeks, um, then got reduced to three to four weeks. Sometimes now we actually seed uh, the next cover crop as we till down the former one. In other words, there's really no period of tillage, but that didn't, that took a number of years to get there. So that, that is actually, I guess what I wanted to just conclude with is uh, some of the pros and cons of our system. And we've already touched on soil health. Um, I think one of the benefits of very low weed pressure is we've able to do a lot of low-till planting and also interseed a lot of the vegetables. I assume that is good for soil health. Uh, the trade-off there is certainly over the years we've a lot used a lot of tillage to reduce the weed seed bank. And I think a real big one is by virtually eliminating weeds we do not have their benefit for improving soil health. 
And I don't know if anyone's ever studied that, but I'm sure weeds are improving soil through their root system, through the organic matter they provide, uh, and in just the diversity they add to the overall system. There's um, another aspect that we could look at, uh, one that I had never really thought about before, uh, which was introduced to me by a weed scientist in Maine, uh, Eric Gallant. He called up to see if it would be possible to take some soil samples from our farm when he uh, dropped off his one of his daughters at college here in Pennsylvania and uh, wanted to compare it to the farms he was uh, sampling there in Maine. And this is a pretty casual study. They basically just take the soil samples, put it in a flat in the greenhouse and water it and just see what grows. And he said the flats with our soil are just what you want to see for a healthy weed ecology. That was very few numbers of a wide diversity of weeds. I never really thought about that before, but where he said on many of the other farms, there was very high numbers of just a few weeds. And from his point of view, that is an unhealthy uh, weed situation to have. Uh, what about economics? Well, a big one here is having surplus land. At least for us, uh, as I've described, we have half uh, as many acres in fallow or cover crops as we do vegetables. If you only have access to two acres, it just may not be economic uh, to use this system. Although I think uh, it could be very beneficial to use the principles, maybe just without actually taking land out of production. Uh, management. You're going to be managing uh, cover crops and fallow fields as well as your vegetable fields. And there's going to be somewhat of a, of a learning curve to implementing uh, the fallow uh, field system. So these are things to take into account. Uh, over time, uh, management will become much easier and uh, take up much less of your time. What about labor? Uh, you know, it's it's a little hard for me to get a handle on that because we don't, you know, it's not like we left half of the farm uh, with, without our system uh, to compare. Uh, but a number of years ago, I guess this is back in uh, 2008, we did kind of a comparison uh, looking at a quarter acre of our carrots in production and compared that uh, with the carrot budgets in Richard Wiswall's excellent book, The Organic Farmer's Business Handbook. So we basically extrapolated, I think he does it by two beds, we extrapolated uh, that to a quarter acre. Now keep in mind, it's not uh, exactly a fair comparison because he's growing three rows of carrots on beds on 72 inch centers. Well, we grow all of our crops in single rows 34 inches apart. So he's growing more carrots in that quarter acre uh, than we are. Uh, I mean, if you're interested, I can give you kind of a, uh, a complete uh, comparison between the farms in terms of uh, field management. But in, as far as the question on weed control, um, uh, Richard Wiswall, uh, had uh, seven passes with the tractor uh, that included flaming, uh, several passes uh, with the basket weeders, and then follow up uh, with sweeps. I don't know how typical that is of uh, vegetable management, uh, but I know he's a good farmer. They also invested uh, 32 hours of hand weeding. On our farm, uh, we made uh, one pass uh, one cultivation uh, with the horses that was about six weeks after seeding the carrots and we spent a half hour hand weeding. So it's quite a quite a contrast there between the two farms. Um, there are many 
areas where uh, Wiswall's system greatly excels ours for carrot production. And if you're interested, I can enumerate that, but uh, maybe I'll wait and see if there's actually questions. So that uh, kind of uh, wraps up what I had planned to speak about this evening. And maybe I've taken up too much time as it is. No. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, yeah. I think we've got a couple of questions from the Q&A. So Gina, if you want to uh, share those. Yes. So the first question is, when you say fallow, do you, is, does that mean no cover crop or nothing? Great question, and I'm afraid we use that term uh, in two ways. Uh, when we refer to a fallow year, we just mean a year out of vegetable production, okay? But it is a managed fallow that includes cover crops and bare fallow periods. So a bare fallow period is when we're actively using tillage uh, to reduce the number of weed seeds in the soil. Okay, so two uses of the word fair, fallow, and uh, oh, I hope I didn't completely confuse you. That's good. And then the next question is submitted by Heather. She says, so do I understand that after eight years of the cover crop clock, you've been able to reduce the frequency of fallow tillage events every year? Yes, it has, uh, we have reduced the length of the bare fallow and also how frequently we till during it. And we've also, as I alluded to at the beginning, we also have changed the time of year when we use the bare fallow as we've kind of shifted our emphasis on which uh, weeds we wanted to prior prioritize. And then the next question is submitted by Brian. He says, if you do not have multiple fields as depicted, would you recommend submitting, substituting rows as fields as depicted on your slides? Um, yeah, and, and by rows, you're talking about, uh, say, beds with several rows in it, or... Um, I, think I, guess, I guess I would say, it really comes down to what management units are the most applicable for you to use. So if, uh, if you aren't grouping, say, your rows or beds in a particular way that you might consider a field, say, all carrot rows or all early planted crops or all heavy feeders, uh, then it probably would be worth doing it on just a, a row by row basis, but whatever is most efficient and practical. Okay. And the, the next question is any recommendations, suggestions, or tips for spotted knapweed management? I, I cannot give any recommendations because it's not a weed that, uh, we deal with here. Um, and I'm thinking, is that mainly a pasture weed? Yeah, I don't, maybe Sam can comment on this or, or <laughs> the spot of nap. I mean, the only reason I know that uh, there's a great video out there about uh, training cattle uh, to eat. And I thought it was that weed, but maybe it was another one. Uh, uh, training them to eat these weeds and, uh, and that way reducing them over time in a permanent grassland situation. Okay. And she did say that it is, it is a pasture weed. Yes, that's what I was thinking. So um, I don't know what type of livestock you are pasturing, uh, but as I remember it, if, if they don't like it anyway, and she was training cattle to eat uh, thistle, all sorts of unpalatable weeds, and basically by chopping them up in a bucket and putting molasses on it, getting them to taste it, getting them used to the texture of it. And then once they relished it, uh, turning them out to pasture to eat the weeds. <laughs> All 
All right, and one final question. Uh, it says, for a small operation of veggie gardens, does it make sense to worry about pest management and what are the best options? Um, I guess I don't quite get the question. Is it, is it to worrying about uh, pests in, in terms of weeds or just all types of pests? <laughs> Let's see here. Weeds. So the question is, is it even worth uh, worrying about the weeds? Correct. Did in I get that right? Veggie, yeah. In a small veggie garden. Yeah. No, I, I mean, um, uh, I think it really depends on your labor availability and whether uh, you can manage the weeds by hand, cultivation, using uh, some of the equipment that I imagine Sam is going to talk about. Um, to me, the biggest benefit of our system is that we don't have to worry about the weather. Okay? 2018, very wet here from the middle of the season on. Almost impossible to do any cultivation but it had no effect on weed pressure in our crops, okay? That, I think, paid for itself right there. Um, <clears throat> if you have perfect weather, I'm not sure the difference is big enough. It's really when the situations are challenging uh, that the low weed pressure, I think, really shines. Okay. Um, so I think we'll hold any other questions for right now. And uh, Gina, if you want to have Eric on mute and we'll transition over, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and we'll bring in Sam Oswald Tilton uh, from Lakeshore Community College uh, out in Wisconsin. Uh, Sam was one of our uh, uh, highly uh, sought after and highly rated speakers from the conference this year. And we thought we'd uh, use this as an opportunity to uh, bring him back in season uh, to hear a little bit more and to uh, give you all a, a chance to ask any questions that have come up since then, if you were able to see him at the conference. So um, we'll hand it over to Sam. Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, greens from the shores of Lake Michigan here in Wisconsin. Uh, I have to say that uh, my first year of farming, I was working for an Amish horse farmer in western Wisconsin. And, uh, yeah, you know, I knew almost nothing. And the book that he gave me was Weed the Soil, Not the Crop by Eric. And uh, so I've, I've been appreciating uh, Eric's experience on this for many years and, uh, and nice enough to uh, be corresponding with him uh, over the past few years. And so it's a real honor to, to be speaking with you, Eric. So I just wanted to say that and we're all lucky to hear from you. Uh, thanks for Pasa to having me. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen here through the magic of uh, digital communication. We'll see how this goes and I'm hoping you guys can, can see the screen. Yep, we're seeing it in the uh, preview mode. I don't know if you want to make it uh, in presentation or, or this. Oh, I'll, I'll leave it here, thank you. Sure. Um, so I wanted to start and just say a few things about ecological weed control, which is really kind of repeating a lot of the things Eric said, uh, but maybe in some different ways, which I, I think is helpful. Um, and then um, I wanted to talk about how to choose your spacing, which I think ends up being really important um, with what tools you can use. Uh, and then I'll talk about some tools in particular. And this picture I'm starting with here is, uh, is my pyramid of cultivation. And um, for me, when I hear a lot of different pieces of information, they get confusing and I have to, you know, put it into like a, a system or something, an organization that makes sense. And so this is how I make sense of all this. Um, and here at the bottom, you see what Eric spent so much time trying to share with us um, about having a low weed seed bank, very few weed seeds in the soil to begin with. Um, and, and then what we wanna do is having a size difference between our crop and, and our weed. Um, and these are what we call ecological weed management. And the, the kind of um, options available to us with ecological weed management are in some ways really easy to make. You know, you can be sitting around, um, uh, on your couch in the winter time with your notebook and pencil and thinking what's my crop rotation going to be? What am I going to put in this field? What type of tillage am I going to use? 
um, what are my weeds, what I would think of as kind of weed jujitsu. And what's really neat is, you know, half an hour of thinking in the winter can be the equivalent of, you know, three days of hand weeding in the summer in terms of it'll save you that amount of time. Um, and then uh, what I'd recommend is try and think of your weed control as a system. And of course, you know, unfortunately, it, it won't frequently turn out that way. You know, it's too wet to get into the field, a machine breaks, et cetera, you have to make do, that's what farming is. But have some idea of ideally, you know, what is the ecological weed management that you're doing? And um, how are you putting plants in the ground so that you can manage weeds later? And then what tools are you using in a sequence? And have an idea of that ideal, and you'll be able to do it sometimes, um, and you can always vary from it, but I, I really like having a, an idea of, of the progression of what I want to have happen. Um, so I, let me talk just a little bit about that ecological weed control. And to toot uh, Eric's horn for him here, um, here's that, that picture of soil that he was talking about. And here's uh, Eric Gallant from Maine who built that. And these are different weed seed banks. So Eric just took different soils from different farms and put them in a greenhouse under ideal moisture and saw what happened. And here you can see on the left, looks like some lambs quarters uh, and some grasses. Here you can see in the middle, uh, just a single variety of grass coming up. And here you can see on the right, on this particular example of Eric's soil, I don't see any weeds that came up. And this is what Eric's talking about when he says, you know, for his system in a wet year, it's really handy because there's so few weed seeds in the soil um, over the years through his cultural practices that there's very few weeds coming up. And this is what I mean in terms of um, weeding jujitsu. In the winter, if you can plan these cultural practices and then implement them uh, you know, throughout the growing season, you can drastically reduce the weeds that are even coming up. And here you can see it says, what is 10% of 10 versus what is 10% of 1,000? And what I mean is, if I have uh, 10 weeds, and I've got my cultivator killing 90% of them and only 10% are left, I'm left with one weed you know, per square foot or what have you. That's pretty good, I can handle that. But let's say here on the left, I've got a thousand weeds and I'm killing 90% and 10% or less. Well, what's 10% of a thousand? I believe it's a hundred. So you can see that depending on your weed density, even if you have the most perfect tools, most perfect conditions, you have them adjusted perfectly, um, with a really high weed density, you're not going to get uh, the clean fields that you can have with fewer weeds coming up. So you can see the importance of these ecological um, um, weeding methods before we even get to shiny pieces of metal. And one thing that I, I would really encourage everyone to do is, is know um, by sight the top three to five problem weeds on your farm. And know them at different growth stages. So maybe know them right when they um, pop out of the ground with their cotyledons or seed leaves and know them uh, later on too when they're setting seed. And, and let me show another picture as to why I think that's helpful. Um, when you know your weeds, you kind of know your enemy. And, and, and when you know the characteristics of your weeds, you can really design your ecological weed management practices, your rotations, to target them at their weakest point. So for example, here's a chart and it shows a lot of common weeds, at least here in the Midwest, and it shows when they emerge. So if I know my top three to five problem weeds, I can start getting to know their characteristics. And one really important characteristic is when do they emerge? For example, if I am planting, say, carrots, something that's not very um, weed competitive, and I know that uh, one of my main problem weeds emerges, say, around the beginning of June, I want to time my carrots to plant them either before the beginning of June or after that. And I'm going to kind of seed that timing to the weeds and I'll probably implement um, uh, a little bit of bare fallow right when that weed wants to come up uh, and encourage it to come up. Like Eric was saying, I want to give it a nice firm seed bed, good seed soil contact. I want to give it moisture um, so that that annual weeds right when it wants to come up, great, hey, come up and I'm gonna do a little tillage and kill you. Hey, come up again 10 days later, and I'm gonna do a little tillage and kill you. And you can see that in that way, we're gonna lower the weed seed bank over time. Um, so, so know your top three or five problem weeds and know some of their um, characteristics. So here's when they emerge. And here's another example, is when do they set seed? 
And this isn't the, the clearest um, table, it's from a Dutch publication. But anyhow, you can see for some popular weeds in the Netherlands, and again, just an example, um, you can see what month do they set seed. So for example, let's say that my lambs quarters population, they call it fat hen over there. Let's say that my lambs quarters population uh, is really exploding, okay? So one, I wanna know when does it tend to emerge, but I also wanna know when does it tend to set seed? Because what do we say, uh, what, one year's seeding and seven years weeding? Uh, if we can keep weeds from going to seed, uh, that does a huge service to draining the weed seed bank because we're not getting those inputs of more seed. So know your, uh, know your weeds and some of their characteristics. And just to show a little example, um, here's from uh, soybeans, but you can see the soybeans on the right, well, you can barely see them, can't you? There's a lot of uh, foxtail and other grasses in there. And they were planted June 2nd, right? When a lot of those annual weeds want to jump up, okay? And on the left, those soybeans look good to me, and they were planted at the end of June. Um, and you can see this picture was taken on the same day, you can see the importance of planting date there. So that farmer, you know, way to go, um, she knew her most common weeds and she knew when they were gonna come up. And she said, hey, you're coming up at the beginning of June, I'm gonna let you have it, okay? And I'm gonna plant a little bit later. Um, so again, know, know your most common weeds so that you can, uh, you can do something about it, okay? And then you can also start to tailor your tillage uh, to your weed situation. So here's a little fun fact. Uh, about 60% of giant ragweed seeds placed on the soil surface were consumed by insects and mammals between November and May, you know, say in the winter. Uh, and over a year, 88% were removed, okay? So what does that tell me? What I can start to think of now, can you guys see that I just switched screens, Dan, or are you still on the PowerPoint presentation? We're still on the PowerPoint. Okay. I, I think that if you, you go to the screen share and then choose a different window, um, that would be the way to change it. Got it. I will uh, attempt to do that. I just have to make this big. Uh -huh. Well, give me one more, one more. Uh, Try here, guys. Sure. And I'll just remind uh, anybody who joined late that we're using the Q&A box tonight. So if you do have any uh, questions, please do use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And, and we'll while, as we can. And, <laughs> and while you are trying to navigate your presentation, uh, we do have a question. Maybe. Oh, great. Um, it says, any suggestions for mugwort? Mugwort, uh, not off the top. I'm not familiar with mugwort, although I'm gonna suggest this, um, and, and this is the teacher in me, which is making you answer the question, so I apologize. But uh, while I keep talking, and maybe you already know, uh, mugwort, I believe, is, a, is an annual weed. Um, find out when does that weed set seed? Uh, and, and, um, and then if you can tell me that, you know, maybe we can start to, to talk a little bit more about it. And also perfect timing for the question because I was able to figure out going to the next screen. So thank you for that. Okay. Okay, I think it's switched screens there. Um, so the other thing with, um, with getting into the weeds kind of and, and really knowing your ecological weed control, here's a chart. And it shows that for different tillage uh, operations, moldboard plowing, chisel plow, ridge till, no till, you can see where it deposited different percentages of weed seeds. Okay, um, so moldboard plowed tend to, tended to distribute them throughout the soil profile, and no till, as you might imagine, left them right on top. And you remember that last slide we were talking about that over one year, 88% of giant ragweed seeds were predated by mammals. So this is another thing that. Um, that using your tillage, you can start to target your tillage um, to reduce your weed seed bank. And so I wanna read a quote here from my friend Hans Bishop. And he said, all these tools are great, these fancy weeding tools, but I'm realizing that I'm only as good as my planning. And as John Peterson said, the tools are secondary, but their timing is primary. But I'm starting to see that even before the timing of using a tool is the much bigger picture of planning. I need to use my rotations, 
cover crops, summer fallows, and stale seed beds to target specific weeds and fields and tailor make the place where I plant each crop. And so Hans used to plan, you know, in the winter where his carrots would go that spring. And what he realized is that he wanted to plan a year or two ahead where those carrots were going to go. So for example, he called me one time, he said, Sam, um, I'm just pulling off my sweet potato crop and I had a whole lot of foxtail go to seed and I, I have to put my um, carrots there next year and what should I do? And we talked about it and we said, well, Hans, you've got uh, maybe two options. And one is you can either uh, not till at all to leave those seeds on the surface or maybe really, really shallowly till with a rototiller so that you're gonna have a lot of predation over the winter on those seeds. And he said, no, Sam, I, I can't risk that. And so what he ended up doing uh, was, um, was moldboard plowing as deeply as possible. And the reason is that he wanted to bury those seeds. And so he knew that those sins would come back to haunt him. You know, in future years through tillage, um, he would slowly bring those weed seeds up and have to deal with them and work them out of the weed seed bowl. But he was tailoring his tillage um, to the coming crop the next year, you know, knowing that carrots aren't weed competitive and he wanted to get rid of as much of those um, weed seeds as possible. And again, he could have decided to leave them just on the surface uh, and hope that he would have as much uh, animal and insect predation as possible. But this is just to say in this weed jujitsu, know your weed, know your crop, and even know your tillage. And you can start to work all these things together, again, before you ever bring a piece of metal into the field to cultivate, uh, to try and reduce your weed season. Okay, but now let's talk about kind of moving along. Uh, another practice that, that Eric mentioned is the, the false seed bed. And there's something that you really have to know here. I used to try the false seed bed and I never had great success with it. I would rototill, you know, uh, until I, I found out that 90% of horticultural weeds germinate in the top inch and a half of soil. And that's so important, I'm gonna say it again. 90% of horticultural weeds germinate in the top inch and a half of soil. And what does that mean? Why did I repeat it twice and why do I have it tattooed on my shoulder? I don't really have it tattooed, but it's that important. The reason is that um, if we have weed seeds below an inch and a half, generally they're gonna sit there, right? Uh, any plant needs oxygen um, and uh, often needs light to, to germinate. And the weed seeds that are lower than an inch and a half, they're often just gonna sit there, okay? And what that means is this, when you were practicing a false seed bed, when you were tilling to kill weeds just before your crop, if you're able to till no deeper than an inch and a half, what you can do is you can drain that top layer of weed seeds without bringing up more seeds to germinate. And what I was doing wrong is I was tilling, you know, say two, three, four inches deep on that roto tiller. I never had it too precise. And, um, and so every time I killed weeds, I was just bringing more up from an inch and a half and below that would germinate. And so um, uh, the ability to work your soil shallowly is crucial, um, not only to perform a false seed bed, um, but also when it comes for weeding tools um, to work wet soils. So oftentimes, right, the top, uh, say two inches of soil will dry out, um, but the bottom uh, layers will be more wet. And if you have tools that, you know, uh, can only work, say, four inches shallow, you're going to have to wait to get in that field. But if you can work just two inches or even one inches deep, you can get into fields a lot earlier, okay? Um, so that's one thing I wanted to point out was with false seed beds, you can see here we prepare the seed bed. Here, like Eric was saying, we maybe even water to really encourage those weeds to germinate. Here they germinate, they come up, and here we till them, but we follow that inch and a half rule. And so when we put our crop in, hopefully we've kind of um, exhausted that top layer of weed seeds. Uh, and so just our crop is there. And another take on this um, that Richard Wiswall, you know, um, uh, loves is flame weeding. And the great thing about flame weeding is you're not um, turning over the soil. So you don't have to worry about that depth at all. You know, you're just flaming the top. You don't have to worry about having um, precision weed. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's the stale seedbed method. I want to take just a moment um, and show an example. So here on the left is some of my graduate work at Michigan State. These are carrots. And I'd like to say I meant to do this to show you this picture, but in fact, one of the burners just turned off. Um, but anyway, here on the left, you can see carrots that were flamed. So we let weeds come up 
uh, or I'm sorry, we planted the crop, carrots, and just before they emerged, but when many weeds had emerged, we flamed them. And you can see the result is a very clean line of carrots uh, versus the right where we didn't. Um, and then different options for machinery. So for example, here uh, on this cub, they're seeding on the back with a jank seeder, but right in front, they've got their budding basket weeder set with the baskets pulled tight together um, so that they're doing a real shallow cultivation, killing any weeds just before they plant. And here's an example from Hans. Uh, he would do two or even three stale seed beddings as shallowly as possible. Uh, and here he has these carrots uh, four to five weeks old, and they've never been hand weeded. Here they're just starting on the end. You can see they look pretty darn clean to me. Okay. Uh, and ah, the other thing that I think is really important, again, before we ever bring a tool to the field, uh, is planting and precision. And so when I used to work for um, a weeding tool company, I'd go around Europe, I'd go around the US, and I'd come to a farmer's field, and they always treated us like we were magicians. You know, sell me this fancy piece of metal and, and solve all my problems. And um, there's some times when you can't do that. And what was so disappointing was showing up at a farmer's field, um, either for a demonstration or, or, or to uh, recommend a tool, and you see that their rows are crooked, right? So, so Eric, for example, he's weeding one row at once, but even for him, the straighter that row is, the easier it is to follow, right? If it goes all over, he's having to have his horses move left, right. You know, they're probably not too happy with them by the end of the day. Um, but for a lot of us that are growing in bed cultures, like, you know, Richard Wiswell, for example, we've got multiple um, uh, rows that we're weeding at once. And they have to be uh, as laser straight as possible. And they all have, uh, also have to be evenly spaced. And for example, you can see in this diagram, uh, if I have a cedar that's dropping seeds, you know, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, well, what that means is I can't cultivate in tight to that, okay? Versus uh, here, this picture on the left, if I'm dropping seeds in a very straight line, I can get very close to them. Um, so really think about precision uh, uh, when you start planting, you know, even before you bring a weeding tool out. And that goes for transplants too. And, and again, no matter what scale you're on, these are principles and you can apply them at any scale. So for example, here's a farmer um, and they transplant by hand, but you can see on the left that they've gone through with a tool um, to mark a grid system, uh, both sort of X, Y. And so they know exactly, bam, right where that transplant needs to go. And, and hopefully they're communicating with their employees so that the employees know the big picture, how everything's connected, and why it's important that they put that plant right where it needs to go. Um, so that when they come back with a weeding tool later, they can be uh, much more precise. And if you want to up your precision even more, um, uh, you know, mechanical transplanting planting is a great way to do that. And you can see here um, how parallel and how straight these rows are. And the plants are just going right into the ground. Um, okay, now I am going to uh, switch to yet another presentation, I hope. Okay, Dan, was I successful? Uh, we're looking at summary of common configurations. Fantastic, okay. Great. Um, now, it's always crucial for me to know if I'm talking to row crop farmers or vegetable farmers. And Dan told me that most of you guys are vegetable farmers and, and know that you're near and dear in my heart. That was what I was grew with vegetables. Um, but the reason that's important is because um, row crops technically are in rows, uh, um, which is, is uh, kind of Eric's system for growing. He's in these widely spaced rows, okay? Um, but there are a, most or a lot of vegetable growers that grow in beds, okay? And what that allows you to do, like, like Eric was saying when he compared to Richard Wiswall, is you can fit a lot more vegetables into a given area, okay? So for example, that um, person who asked a question about not having whole fields to rotate between, he probably had uh, less space and so wanted to pack more in there. And I wanted to take a moment um, to urge you to really think about your culture or your configuration. And let me show you a picture. Um, what I mean by that is how far apart are your walkways or your tires and how far apart are your rows and how many rows are you fitting in, okay? And this ends up being extremely important and also extremely important to choose kind of before you start getting into the game. Because if you know what your configuration is to start out and you stick to it, you can buy uh, machines that fit that configuration. 
But if you're like me and you didn't really know about this stuff when you start out, you're buying this, you're buying that, and, and then you got to, you know, trade stuff with it. And um, let me just give you one example. So this is a really popular configuration, okay? And this is um, tire tracks on 60 inches. Uh, Eric mentioned that Richard Wiswall's on 72 inches, six feet apart. That's also really common, okay? So that means from center to center of tire, I'm 60 inches apart, okay? And generally, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be prepared to grow three rows of crops 15 inches apart. And again, these are just principles. If you want to grow them, you know, 16 inches apart or um, have your tire track 72 inches, whatever. Just pick a spacing and stick with it. That's all I'm saying, okay? And the importance of having a configuration is this. Um, you can grow all your crops on the same sort of spacing and never have to move your machinery around. You don't have to switch your planter. You don't have to switch your weeding tool. This is what I mean. So here's three rows, okay? So let's say I'm growing old lettuce, okay? I can fit in three rows of lettuce 15 inches apart, so I do that, okay? But let's say I switch crops and I'm growing, say, um, kale or broccoli, and I can fit those in two rows apart. Well, look what I just did. I just didn't plant a middle row. I've got my two outside rows that are now 30 inches apart. Then I have to go to my planter or transplanter toolbar and bang something around or change my row marker or change my weeding tools. Nope, didn't touch anything. I still just ran it down the middle and uh, and pull and uh, and now I'm just planting two rows. But let's say I've got a one row crop like tomatoes or squash, something like that. Here I can just plant it right in the middle row. And again, I'm not changing my planter or my seeder. I might just be dropping or lifting a sweep. But you can see how this really gives you more of a system. Um, that things can fit on. And, you know, let's say you want to grow um, uh, lettuce mix or something that's even more close. You could put in a fourth and a fifth row, again, always evenly spaced apart um, so that you'd still be on that same spacing, okay? Um, so that's the importance of a, of a cultural system or a row configuration. And I could get more into it. And in fact, I did in my presentation at the PASA conference this winter, which I think you could look up if you want to see a further explanation. Um, but the big takeaway there is have a system, stick with it, and, and then you can buy your machinery appropriately. And, and believe me when I say that you'll really see it save, save you time, okay? Um, and now I wanted to take just a moment uh, and talk about tools, okay, weeding tools. Uh, we're finally getting to the shiny metal. And a really important thing um, is what type of tool carrier you're going to use. So a lot of people are using cultivating tractors. So you've got your smaller cultivating tractors, say your Alice G, a tough built, an international, something like that, international cub. You've got uh, more medium sized cultivating tractors, uh, international 140, international 275, a newer model, or a Kubota L245. And then you've got even bigger cultivating tractors. Most popular is probably an international model C, okay? And as you go up, you're gonna get more space under the belly for tools, and you're also gonna have more horsepower so you can move more soil. So for example, I wouldn't be so excited about killing potatoes with an Alice G, uh, but with a Super C, I could really move a lot of soil. So that's just something to think about is what's your tool carrier, okay? And I am going to switch to a different screen yet again. <laughs> I think right here, uh, okay. And so let me take a moment to talk about um, tools. Okay, I'm gonna give you a few of my, uh, my commandments of tools. Okay, here you go. One, choose a row configuration that gives your tools enough room to work. So what that means is a lot of times, um, say people are really into Elliott Coleman or JM48, you know, 30 inch beds and uh, what, 10 inch rows or so. That's great, you are gonna fit a heck of a lot of food into a small space much more than Eric does on his 30 inch rows, okay? But the downside to that is, as your rows get closer, you have less um, room to fit weeding tools. So you, on, on that 10 inch spacing, 30 inch beds, you pretty much have to use hand tools, okay? So whatever method you wanna use for weeding, if it's tractor tools, hand tools, make sure that your configuration, your cultural system is giving you the space to do so, okay? Um, choose a row configuration and stick to it. Um, have tools that are able to operate shallowly. We talked about that so that you can get into that field um, even when it's wet. 
stale seed bed when possible. You want to really reduce that weed seed bank so that less weeds are coming up. Um, have enough seeders to seed all the rows at once so you can create parallel rows. And when I was starting off, I only had one earthway seeder, but I did my best to use that row marker um, to get really parallel rows. And whatever you can, get, get the number of seeders or rows that you're seeding because then they'll be even straighter. Um, your tool should be set up exactly on your row spacing. So I would come to a farm, farmer will say, oh, I'm on 15 inch rows. I get the measuring tape out, pull it across the planter, the weeding tools. Oh, one's at 16 inches, one's at 14 and a half on the seeders. Then on the weeding tools, they're a little different. No, not, not good enough if you want to get close. And getting close is what's really going to save you money. Um, so put those tools exactly where you need them to go. And get like a permanent marker or one of those bright paint markers and mark on the toolbar where they should go. Because we live in a physical world and you're going to hit a rock, something bends, and it'll move but then at least you can see it's out of space, okay? Um, your tool should respond to the ground conditions row by row. And so something like a, um, a parallelogram, a parallel unit with a depth gauge wheel is gonna let your tool um, float with the ground and maintain a consistent depth and not dig in too deep, okay? Now here's a big one. You should cultivate before you see weeds. And the goal is that cultivation is a preventative practice. It's not reactionary. And of course, it happens to everyone. Uh, but um, you know, when your weeds are four, six, eight inches tall, that's not when you want to be weeding. Um, they, they're the hardest to kill at that point. You really want to weed when your fields look totally clean, and then they're going to stay clean. Um, and the goal, if you can, over your career, is to have several weeding tools. And the goal is that you want to have one perfectly adjusted for one job, uh, so that you're not out there with a wrench. You want to kind of set it and forget it if anyone's a child of the 80s or 90s. Um, so try and, you know, accumulate those weeding tools at auctions or whatnot so you can get them set up. Um, Dan, would you think it's a good time that I stop now for questions or talk a little bit more about tools? Um, we don't have any uh, anything that's specific to what you've been mentioning so far. We do have a couple of questions for the end. So I'd say if you want to go ahead with a couple of tools and then, yeah, we'll leave a little time for Q&A uh, in a little Sounds bit. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, okay. So first, first kind of tool is uh, pre-emergence harrowing. Okay. So you could plant a crop um, and even before it emerges, you could harrow over the top to kill emerged weeds. And this works best with crops that are planted deeper, you know, say um, green beans, sweet corn, stuff like that, where you'll have weeds emerging over the crop and you can harrow them. Um, and again, these are tools that can be adapted in any way. So here's a hand tool um, harrow. Here's a flex time harrow underneath a G. And of course, you could put them behind uh, a tractor. Okay. And again, wheel hose. It's all just about principles. You'll see this wheel hole has four wheels. You know, most of them are like this and have two. But this wheel hole really follows these principles of good cultivation. And it has four wheels so that it maintains um, uh, a uniform depth of the tools all the time. So you can see in this picture, that tool is going to stay parallel to the ground. And they can really do um, a really uh, shallow weeding. Otherwise, when I'm on my you know, valley oak wheel hole, as I go up and down, as I get tired, the angle of that blade into the soil changes. And I go, and I go deeper into the seed. Um, and here you can see there's a lot of options. Um, for example, here are our um, cutaway discs to cut away the soil very close to the row. And here are finger weeders to reach into the row. But uh, again, it is a two-wheeled tool, and so they're not going to have um, the depth control that we really want. Um, walk behind tractors are also an option. And um, really consider your scale when you're getting in, into tools. I know for me, it was tempting to think, oh, I got to grow 10 acres and have a G, an Alice G, you know. Um, but the, the scale really matters. And, and for example, hand tools can do a good job for quite a while. And um, also uh, walk behind tractors can do a good job for quite a while. Um, for example, oh, I think I can just switch tabs here, maybe. Um, for example, uh, well, never mind. Uh, for example, the Tillmore Company um, has a uh, fantastic um, walk behind tool available now, which is a, a brand new walk behind tractor. So I'm just saying, whatever your um, scale is, don't think that you have to be at a certain scale. Really think about um, how much things cost and, um, and the price of things. 
uh, which I guess are the same thing, when you're picking your tools, because you can adapt these tools for any scale, okay? And uh, let me get back to where I was here. Do, 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 do. There we go, okay, I think we're there. Um, and then if you jump up a little bit, another thing that uh, people can do is a um, rear-mounted steerable toolbar. And these aren't cheap, they generally cost about $10,000. But what they allow you to do is have plenty of space and incorporate a lot of tools. So for example, here is a, um, a um, parallelogram with a gauge wheel. And so that gauge wheel is following the depth of the, the contour of the ground. And the knife here is maintaining uh, constant depth. And so you're really getting um, a tool working just the surface of the soil. This particular um, knife is mounted on what's called a vibro shank. You'll see it's not bolted rigidly to the toolbar. And what that means is two things. One, if that knife hits a stone, it can flex around it and won't break. But the other thing is as it moves, it vibrates. And that's nice to separate um, soil from weeds so that the weeds are more likely to die. Um, and this also has uh, finger weeders that are gonna reach into the crop row. And because um, uh, people are steering, uh, you can get extremely close to the crop row. Um, and this is a, a tool that you'd probably find at an auction for, I don't know, 200 bucks or something. But again, all the elements are there. You'll see it's got a parallelogram, it's got um, uh, depth control wheels, and it's got Danish S times that you can move in and out of the row. Um, so again, they're all just principles. Um, here's some carrots that are just coming up, and precision really matters because the earlier that you can get in, the better. But when crops are small, you have to be very careful, you know, about burying them or whatnot. Um, and there's other options for all these tools. So for example, here's a a flex time cultivator with springs. And there's also hydraulically controlled uh, for people that are at a bigger scale. Um, and, uh, and they allow a lot more precision. And one other tool I wanted to show, um, this, is for, um, uh, this is for an LSG or a modern LSG, this tough build. And this is um, a tool that again, has all the elements of precision and it's just fit in this tiny space underneath the belly of this tractor. And here are depth gauge wheels up front to hold things um, shallowly in the soil. Here are side knives that can run very close to the crop and leave just a narrow band of uncultivated soil. And here are finger weeders that can reach into the crop row. And here's another uh, side example of that tool. And these are available, this happens to be a pulp press brand, um, but these are available um, from different um, suppliers. So just to say, there's a lot of uh, principles and fundamentals of weeding tools, but whatever scale you're at, you know, hand, walk behind tractor, um, belly mounted tractor, rear mounted tractor, um, you can adapt those tools for, for all different conditions. And I think I will um, stop there and, and turn it back over to you again. Okay, great. Thank you, Sam. Um, Gina, if you wanna unmute uh, Eric, um, we do have a couple questions here outstanding. Um, one was, uh, I think to Eric in particular, um, what did you do in the fallow tillage in 2018 uh, when it was too wet for tillage? So I guess uh, dealing with moisture um, during 2018. And let me just, okay, Eric, go ahead. You know, that's a great question. and. Uh, Dan, do you happen to have the uh, photos that Sarah, I, we'd sent to Sarah? Yeah, I can pull up. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's actually a sequence of one field, but uh, I don't know if people want to be bothered with that. But, but <clears throat> we were somewhat fortunate that year in that almost uh, the majority of our fallow fields, we had already seeded down before the wet weather hit. And then uh, the others, we were able to slip in and uh, plant the fall cover crop. Yep, so we're, we're looking at, I think, leeks and uh, garlic and lettuce, uh, which was a mixed photo that, that Sarah had provided. Okay, well, uh, if you go, like, is photo two show a mower? Uh, yeah, we have the, the mower, yep. Okay, so uh, this is uh, 
It's actually one of the fallow or fields in our uh, PASA soil health trial. But uh, one thing we have started doing uh, to preserve moisture for some of our vegetables is actually grow our mulch materials in the fallow field. And it's also a way to ensure that the mulch materials are weed free. So th that is a case uh, where we're, we're mowing down a cover crop of rye. And then the next photo uh, you can see using a side delivery hay rake uh, to move it right next to some winter squash planted under a row cover. And then in the fourth photo, uh, you can see an implement working up the rye stubble. And in this, this was the, maybe the 13th of July. So it was about a week before the wet weather really set in. And we actually broadcast uh, hairy vetch and crimson clover seed before initiating this uh, shallow tillage. This is just uh, what we call an undercutter set up on one of the riding cultivators. Uh, the next photo, photo five, uh, were going through with a spring tooth harrow, loosening the soil. And then the sixth photo a tool that you may not be familiar with is a rotary hoe. This is normally uh, used at speeds of eight to 10 miles an hour behind a tractor to uh, uh, flick weeds out of the soil right above uh, say a row crop like corn or soybeans. But here with the horses, I don't know if you can tell in the photo, we're actually working a lot of that residue back up to the surface of the soil, almost trying to leave it the way we found it. Uh, photo seven, we're firming the field with a cold packer. So this has all taken place in a couple of hours, uh, one morning. Uh, photo eight, you can see the uh, vetch and clover getting established. And then photo nine, uh, the middle of October, that's actually uh, Dan uh, pulling soil samples in the field. Uh, and so. other than a little bit of chickweed, a fairly weed-free cover crop. Uh, and one of the advantages of this when uh, the crimson clover and vetch are planted in July in our location, if you look at the next photo, uh, this isn't the same field, but it's the same cover crop. It is winter killed. And, uh, and actually, if you look at photo 11, you can see how it's decomposing. The uh, earthworms are taking it down. And this allows us to do uh, very shallow tillage, basically just go in and form the beds for planting vegetables in the spring and trying to keep uh, with what Sam is saying is try not to go much deeper than an inch and a half. We're probably going more like two and a half inches, but uh, try not to upset the weed seed bank uh, before planting vegetables. So <laughs> I, I don't know if you needed all those photos for an answer, but that was uh, one solution of a quick turnaround, uh, one morning of tillage and back to another cover crop. Sam, I'd be curious to hear if you have any thoughts. It doesn't have to be specifically about 2018, but how would you um, on the fly or, or how would you make considerations for, uh, you know, high moisture or, or a wet tillage year? What, what are your considerations in those scenarios? I guess a big, a big thing I would think about in general is um, raised beds. And, and again, I, I, I think Eric and I are offering a good sort of spectrum here where he's, he's coming from a horse perspective, I'm coming from a tractor perspective, but um, I, would, I would be thinking about raised beds. Um, one thing that's really nice, and well, this is less on the fly, is preparing some of your planting area in the fall. Um, and what, what some growers will do is they'll prep raised beds um, in the fall and maybe even cover them with plastic so that in the spring, first thing, you know, none of that melting snow or even precipitation is percolating through that soil if they have plastic on. Um, or if they do, if the beds are raised, the, the water will drain off a lot better. And at least for those early plantings, they'll, they'll have that available. Um, 
Another thing that, that I think about in terms of um, drainage is having the ability to run um, shanks pretty deeply just in the walking paths or the tire tracks. Um, and so when it rains, that can help dry up a bed. So say if I've got a bed of carrots, it's rained pretty heavily. Um, I might run sweeps, you know, 10, 12 inches deep just in the tire tracks, and that's gonna help that bed um, um, dry up a little faster so I can get in there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the other outstanding uh, question we have right now um, just has to do more with uh, the nature of what you consider a weed, I think, basically, that, that a lot of the weed species or the things that we're trying to control for can also be productive um, for pollinators or for medicinals um, and uh, potentially for harvest, depending on, on that. Um, uh, and then you also have to take into consideration how aggressive they are uh, relative to your other uh, desired crops. Um, so I take that probably more as a comment. Um, we have a few minutes here. I don't know uh, if either Sam or, uh, or Eric, you have anything um, by way of, of closing or, or words of wisdom that you'd like to, uh, um, to impart to folks. I, Sam, I do think that you're... Um, your pyramid of, of control strategies is, is a really powerful uh, uh, illustration of, of the reason why prevention is really key in this realm. Um, but yeah, if, if either of you have anything else to close with, uh, I'd, I'd leave it to you. I, I would just dive back into the weeds for a second and, and the um, person who had asked about mugwort um, someone was nice enough to look that up, and I was looking around to see that it's a, a perennial that spreads by rhizome. Um, and I just wanted to say, in general, with rhizominous perennial weeds, the, the really good time to target them, and again, speaking about weed jujitsu, is at the weakest point in their life cycle. Um, and for those perennial weeds that spread by rhizomes, that's in early to mid-spring, um, because in the fall, they've had all season to suck in uh, solar energy and charge up that root battery to get through the winter. Um, but by late spring, they haven't yet put up their, their new leaves for the season, their solar panels, and they've exhausted a lot of their reserves. And so for something like mugwort, or again, a lot of other uh, rhizominous perennial weeds, um, uh, early to mid spring, just when they put that first leaf up, is gonna be a really good time um, for tillage um, and a fallow period. And the other thing to consider is if you can work in any type of forage crop um, to your rotation, that gets mowed. Because what happens is you can use a fallow period for that crop uh, and then you know, seed, seed down uh, either a cover crop or a forage that you're going to harvest for an animal. Um, and as that perennial maybe tries again on its last legs to sprout, um, you're going to keep cutting it down again and again. Um, so I just wanted to try and address that. Thank you. Eric, any, any sort of closing thoughts from you? <laughs> well, I was uh, thinking about the question of, uh, you know, if you have just a smaller operation or garden uh, and whether the kinds of things we're doing really make sense. Uh, this isn't something I can speak from experience with, but I know that uh, a lot of farmers on a small to medium sized scale are using the tarping system. Uh, so you're laying down uh, some dark plastic <clears throat> to kill the vegetations that there and is supposed to also sprout uh, weed seeds underneath. So that might be a way to implement or get some of the benefits of a bare fallow in a, a small patch. Um, one could also use a, a deep straw uh, mulch to accomplish something similar. Um, so I, I guess I'm thinking that uh, a, a lot of the basic principles can transfer, but uh, the techniques are gonna have to be adapted. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I guess just as, as a final thing, uh, would, would either of you, uh, if you have anything that you'd recommend as a resource or, or something for folks for additional reading, um, 
I will say that uh, uh, Eric's book uh, we did, and articles and, and DVD, Weed the Soil, Not the Crop, have been very instructive to me through the years. Uh, and I would suggest that as a place to start. But uh, do either of you have anything else you want to highlight by way of, of resources? There's Sam, do you want to put a plug in for the uh, Michigan State bulletins? I mean, they cover a lot of the ecological principles you were talking about. Yeah, thanks, Eric. I, I would say there's there's bulletins from Michigan State um, about ecological weed management that are wonderful. Um, there is also a, a book from the Dutch called Practical Weed Control, and it's available online as a, as a PDF, um, and it's from the Wageningen University, and maybe we can put a link up later or something. Um, but Practical Weed Control, that PDF book, really clearly lays out a lot of things. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that we have uh, the Midwest Mechanical Weed Control Field Day that this year um, is online. And so uh, you could also look that up, Midwest Mechanical Weed Control Field Day, and we'll talk about a lot of the different um, weeding tools in the field and tool adjustments and things like that. A relatively new book from uh, Europe that covers a lot of these topics is called uh, Weed Management for Organic Farmers, Growers, and Smallholders um, by Gareth Davies, Becky Turner, and Bill Bond. Okay. We'll uh, we'll put up links to, to all of that, uh, all of those uh, in the uh, resources page along with the recording uh, when we get that all processed and posted. Um, for those, uh, if, if you haven't already, please uh, in the chat box, uh, Gina has shared a link to uh, the event evaluation. Uh, if you wouldn't mind just taking a moment to respond to that, uh, it helps us with uh, grant reporting and, and, and event evaluation and all of that. Um, and uh, I want to extend a, a really uh, grateful uh, thanks to Sam and Eric for jumping on with us tonight. This is something I was really excited about and glad that they were both able to join us. Um, we hope uh, you're all able to join us for some of our future IPM sessions and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see you sooner rather than later uh, at a future PASA event in person.